Hello, uh, welcome to this new webinar series co-hosted by the National Good Food Network and the National Farm Inst Institution Metrics Collaborative. I'm joined by Hannah Lighton from Farm to Institution New England and Colleen Matz from the MSU Center for Regional Food Systems who are helping to facilitate on behalf of the collaborative. So the National Good Food Network, coordinated by the Wallace Center at Windrock International, convenes good food professionals in communities of practice to share best practices, solve problems, and continually re-energize. One of these communities of practice is around farm to institution metrics. The organizations in the National Farm to Institution Metrics Collaborative work across the country to measure and track the impact of the institutional market from producer to buyer. The group started in 2014 and now has 30 members based in 20 states working at municipal, county, multi-county, state, regional, and national levels. The collaborative holds quarterly calls and occasional in-person meetings, offers opportunities for collaborative partnership, and provides a platform for sharing best practices, foundational metrics, terminology, tools, and resources. At the end of the webinar, we'll share some information on how to access resources and information on the collaborative. These monthly 30-minute webinars are designed to provide a national audience of farm uh, to institution practitioners, supporters, and advocates with the tools that they need to measure farm to institution efforts in meaningful ways. Okay, so let me now hand it off to Lillian Brislin. Dr. Brislin is the first executive director of the Food Connection, a local food system center at the University of Kentucky. Her work focuses on developing farm to campus value chains, tracking and evaluating farm to campus purchasing initiatives, and growing innovative and sustainable regional value chains that benefit, benefit mid-sized farmers. Lily? Thanks, Jeff. Uh, thanks everyone for joining today. So this is going to be a whirlwind tour through the five-year voyage of the University of Kentucky into local procurement. And um, the goals that I have set out, oops, I think I have this. There we go. So in this next 15, 20 minutes, I'm going to share with you our story and how our understanding of local food and our metrics that define local food have evolved. And I hope to convince you that clear metrics, regular uh, reporting, and really a transparent process for local procurement are what we believe at this point are the keys to success. So what's the story of UK dining? Five years ago, UK, University of Kentucky, moved from self-operating dining to a private service contract for the first time. And when this plan was announced, there was really significant discussion and debate among on and off campus stakeholders, student groups, faculty groups, community-based organizations that made it apparent that UK and uh, our broader community really care about the role of dining in the land grant mission and the health in our local food economy. So as a result of those uh, conversations and the negotiations of the contract, we ended up with a 15-year di dining contract with Aramark um, and an explicit local procurement set of KPIs or key performance indicators that have along with them financial penalties if those numbers-based KPIs are not met, which is pretty unique and also funding for my dream job here at the Food Connection. So we're an academic center that's focused on the study and development of regional and regenerative food systems. So we, I think of us as a farm to table center at the heart of campus um, that's serving as the academic integration of dining into the land grant mission. So what did we design was local. So the contract started with a pretty standard set of local metrics. Uh, this is the then side of the side slide you're looking at, but they didn't stay that way for long. So as you'll see Kentucky Proud, we had a KPI set for Kentucky Proud purchasing, which is a state-based uh, marketing program that brands Kentucky grown, processed, or manufactured food products. So let's keep the idea of how broad that definition is in mind. And then an additional local metric that was purely food miles based that said anything, we want an extra local KPI that's for stuff sourced from Fayette County, which is where Lexington and the University of Kentucky are, and anything immediately surrounding. So this sort of hyper-local definition, which sounded really great. Um, and these are both business level designations, which you'll see we found out mattered. So if the business was located here, they're doing their whatever activities here. This is a Kentucky-based enterprise. We weren't looking at the item level definitions, which is commonly, so business level is what's, what's often happening. And I want to stress that these are very common ways of approaching local food procurement. Most of the local purchasing and survey data we hear about is drawn from similar definitions, right? 250 miles, 150 miles, 
uh, raised and manufactured within the state. And um, we then transitioned to a more specific set, what I'll get into later. But after we looked, we saw some surprising outcomes after the first year of the contract that led UK and Aramark to go back to the negotiating table to create a new set of local KPIs. And the rest of this presentation explains how and why that happened. So way back in 2015, uh, the Food Connection opened our doors just as the first year of the dining contract was winding down. And as one of our first forays into the kind of applied research that we love to do, our team stepped up to provide a more kind of robust view of the data than just Kentucky Proud and Local, because those are pretty high level analyses and categories. And when I say, what actually are we buying? What impact is it having on our local food economy? And our aim in conducting the first dining report that we did was to bring the three land grant pillars of education, outreach, and research to our dining program, to use our campus as that living uh, laboratory to look at local food system development. So what lessons could we share that would help grow all of our regional agri-food systems? And we went through item by item of the local purchases to see exactly what was being purchased and how we could see it impacting our state's food and farm economy. We've continued this tradition. We release a report every year. You can find them all on our website. Um, and we, for our dining report, we came up with this set of classifications. Again, these were never, when we started, this was not a KPI for the contract. This was just a set of classifications that were based on what we saw in the data, a way to find a category for every type of product that fell within these two broad categories of Kentucky Proud and local. And because vendors can sell and redistribute many kinds of products, we classified on the item level, not the business level. So you might be a manufacturer that manufactures product, but also redistributes product from outside of the state, which traditionally would fall all within those food miles definitions. So we looked at the item level and every item is assigned both a farm impact designation and a business impact designation. So you could be have be a Kentucky owned business that creates a value added product that has some farm impact, if that makes sense. It's just another way for us to see and discuss what's going on and assess if it's meeting sort of our goals, the spirit of local food. And this uh, shows us how we have this constant conversation between the what, what are we buying, what are we serving, and the why, why are we doing this local procurement effort. So, when we took a look at the first year of purchasing, this is what we found. Following the Kentucky Proud and Food Miles based definitions of local food, we ended up with purchases that our community felt didn't really meet the spirit of local food, even though they definitely met the letter of the contract in the KPIs. And you may remember the story. There were two products um, that the on and off campus community really latched onto, which were soda that was um, made in Fayette County, it was bottled in Fayette County, and redistributed in Fayette County, and ice. Um, so far from being some sort of evil or disingenuous plot, the local purchasing practices and benchmarks that created the KPIs were actually inherited from when we were self up. So this wasn't some, this was completely consistent with what local purchasing had been prior to the contract. And what I wanna show is that by paying closer attention to exactly the what of local food and by being systematic and transparent and detailed in what we were looking at and reporting, we were able to learn a lot. So we see that you know almost half of the local purchases were um, either not significant value adding happening in the state, they were rebottled pop or ice, um, and only a quarter of these purchases were having any form of farm impact. But we were able to know that because we did the assessment. And you'll see there at the bottom, the local purchasing were 2.36 million of a $10 million total food buy. For our reporting, um, because there's a number of retail establishments on our campus, we have just about 27,000 undergrads at UK. This covers all of those establishments. So this is not just residential dining or, or cafeterias. This includes the Chick-fil-A's, the Starbucks, all of those things on campus. So we went back to the negotiating table. So, and came up um, with these revised KPIs. There we go, checking my notes. So here's the good news. Um, our Kentucky community really cares about UK and our, as a public institution, we recognize our responsibility to our community. So we went back to the negotiating table with our dining partners and revised the KPIs to get them as something more meaningful and impactful to really meet that spirit. So these are what they are. The revised KPIs um, drew on the classification system that we used for that first dining report um, and refined it a bit. 
And so they are not an ideal or a perfect definition of local food, but it's practical and it reflects what was being brought through this system. And this is the two-part KPI. So we have a total Kentucky impact purchasing KPI of this fiscal year, that's 1.7 million and some change. Of that 1.7 million, 672,000 and some change must have at least some farm impact. So this is, I think, um, pretty unique and important. And what we're doing is that while we have this broad local purchasing goal that includes business impact products and supporting that sort of job creation and economic impact, we're really creating an additional emphasis and focus on getting money into the hands of Kentucky producers, farmers. So as you'll see, these new KPIs, farm impact and business impact, are just those earlier classifications with the redistributed products or the no significant value adding products taken out. Okay, so what impact has this had on our procurement process? When the KPI shifted to greater specificity and more importantly to requiring farm impact, even though it's only a portion of what we're doing, we saw a significant shift in the impact of purchasing. So this first column here being fiscal year 15, the first year of the contract to fiscal year 18, using apples to apples comparisons across those years, no pun intended, we see that there's a lot more majority farm impact products happening and um, more Kentucky owned, Kentucky owned and operated business impact happening. And that's getting us to this sort of spirit of local food. Yep, so by being more specific in our metrics and going beyond just food miles, we are having more targeted impact on our Kentucky farms and Kentucky-owned businesses. But there's an even deeper level of granularity we can look at if you're wonky and nerdy like me and you love kind of digging through way too many spreadsheets. Um, we also looked at what types of products were we buying, and this is a really rough classification. Is it a baked good? Is it some sort of processed value-added product, dairy, meat, produce? And what we were able to see was that we really weren't doing so great on produce. You know, if we're just saying, oh, we purchased this much, yes, but of what? Um, we, when we look deeper, we can come up with more uh, resilient and robust strategies for the kinds of impacts we want to have. But if you don't have your own data, if you're dependent on someone else to give it to you, or if you're not thinking about what kind of data you want to track, you don't know what you don't know. So that's what led us to two of the strategies that we just put in place this academic year that we're really excited about. The picture on the right is from one of our two residential dining facilities um, that sort of celebrates the program. So we now have a salad bar program that's done in partnership with the Food Hub, a local food connection based out of Northern Kentucky and Ohio. And every day on our salad bar, you can find Kentucky farm sourced salad greens and salad toppings from 10 different uh, producers and estimated this year that we'll have over 24,000 pounds of produce come through just those two residential dining facility salad bars. We also have um, a whole animal program, which is working with a meat packer here, a local uh, meat aggregator, Marksbury Farms, for past pasture finished meat um, that's uniquely packaged to adapt to the needs of our dining service operators, which we don't have time to get into. And that's looking like three cows and five hogs coming through our residential dining every week. So by having, I'm just going to back up, by thinking a little more strategically and at a slightly more granular level about what exactly are we purchasing, we can come up with uh, strategies that help us get there, as opposed to just taking whatever's coming back of the, out of the back of the distributor's truck. So um what is what does kentucky have to teach the world other than that you should really be picky with your bourbon and root for the wildcats this is uh my soapbox um if you remember horton right i meant what i said and i said what i meant that metrics have to mean what they say and i think that uh so food miles are not a reliable metric food miles just tell us how far something has come from the last point of sale. It's not, you know, we could look at the academic literature, I won't bore you on that, but it's not a reliable indicator of if a product is sustainable or not, even when it comes to transportation and food miles and that sort of carbon footprint. It's not a reliable indicator of how much economic impact is happening in the community or even of the freshness or healthfulness of those products. It just tells you how far the last truck went. And so if we want to, um, if we wanna measure those sorts of dimensions, let's do it. Let's just come up with an actual reliable indicator for that. And so when we clearly state our goals and capture them in reliable metrics, in our case, those goals were impacting Kentucky farms, 
farms in Kentucky on businesses, we can build effective programs, right? When we know what we're aiming for, we can do a better job. And so I would encourage you that anytime you hear someone reporting their local buy, think of Kentucky, think of our story, and maybe ask a few more questions and dig deeper. And in general, we've seen that, again, to summarize, clear metrics and regular reporting and transparency really help all stakeholders get on board and come up with creative solutions. That gets us to a point of strategy, planning, and commitment with growers instead of a taking whatever comes off the back of the truck. And it lets us adapt to the unique and wonderful products that are in our areas. In Kentucky, we have beautiful bluegrass, which gets us beautiful livestock. Um, and that it helps us build deeper collaborations, public-private partnerships in the way all of us want to see. So with that, I will say thank you. I have tried to be brief and tell this very long story in a quick way. Please follow us on social media. You can hear our stories and see what's going on. Um, that is our website where all the previous dining reports are available. You can see how things have changed over the years. And I'll hand it over to beautiful Ms. Hannah. <laughs> Thanks, Lillian. That was um, so much great information, and we appreciate you covering so much in a short amount of time. Um, I want to just remind everyone that um, there's a questions box in um, your control panel, so feel free to keep adding questions as we go through um, the Q&A portion. Um, and Lillian, I want to start by asking if you can talk a little bit more about how you um, communicated with your food service management company or made the case for this work to them and if there has been any um, if there are any bumps along the way that you've learned from or if they've had to pay any of those penalties if you can just talk a little bit more about that relationship yeah so we there's I mean there's the Aramark staff here on campus they're UK dining we talk about them as UK dining on campus and we try to make a united front when it comes to any of that work there's a sustainability manager that's an Aramark employee that really oversees the local dining program as well as their other sustainability efforts and as this program has evolved and when we hit the bumps in the road as you say after that first year of the contract we started meeting more regularly there was more communication about the what and the why and we now have monthly uh monthly meetings where instead of just getting all the all of the purchasing data once at the end of the year as we were uh the food connection invested our resources to develop a, what is now a custom database although we're hoping to move into some third party uh, service around this so that we can look every month to say what are we buying are we hitting our targets what new items are coming on board um, what do we want to see more or less of and so it's become an ongoing conversation which i think helps all of us learn from each other about what we love about this work um, it helps you know we often hear that you need a you need an advocate on the inside of whatever institution you're working with and i do think that's true but it's on us to build those relationships and the more we learn about each other's is our aramark colleagues learn about the college of agriculture and those of us who work in food systems and the more that those of us who work in food systems learn about the world of institutional dining it's a more effective relationship so robust communication all the time i think you know they haven't had to pay any penalties we've been you know it's it's a learning process and it's just a process of getting better and better we now have more great stories to tell we have great examples um, and we're working to do that together and have you found that um as you've been able to um build this relationship and 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 prove that this is making an, an impact that Aramark is interested in replicating the model that UK has with other um, institutions? Tentatively, yes. I think especially um, last year was the first full year of the new KPIs. It was a transition process. You know, large institutions aren't known for turning on a dime. So once once the good stories uh once the easy to tell stories that were well easy to celebrate came out i think the light bulb went off of like oh wow this is a great way for all of us to work together and so they've brought um we've been happy to host a number of regional gatherings we've seen chefs from around the region um come and look at the programs we're doing taste the food visit some of the farms and get that little bit of inspiration so i mean i'm hopeful i think that which is why we all this is not an adversarial relationship. We're not waiting around at the end of the year with our hatchet to be like, ha, give us the money. You didn't make the, we are working together because we all want this to succeed. Because when dining looks good, we look good. Our farmers are happy. There's no, this isn't a game, you know, win-lose game. We really want to get to that finish line together. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that you really like digging into this data. 
Um, I'm wondering, and we have a, a question also about the kinds of resources that go into um, doing this kind of tracking work. Have you had to bring on additional staff or interns or student help? The first two years, it was uh, just me and a little bit of another colleague's time, and we would get a, an Excel sheet dump, and I would start looking through the products. And any of us who do this work, you know, once you go through it, you kind of get this internal database in your head, and you know the manufacturers, and you know the products. Um, so that was a little bit arduous, but not bad. And now we've automated it a bit so we can do these monthly updates. So um, their sustainability manager gets the reports from their two broadline distributors and the few direct purchases that they have, sends us that database, or sends us that data. I have a 10 hour a week graduate assistant that um, helps me clean that data up and put it into the database we've developed. Mm -hmm. And then we just run the reports from there. So it's, it's not so bad. I think we hear a lot that other, um, other accounts, and not just with Aramark, any number, that their distributors don't want to give them the data or say they can't give them the data. I will say there's a big difference between can't and won't. And it might be a little bit, they haven't done it before, they're not sure what you want. But you can get it, and then once you have it in hand, it's, it's not that bad. Even for as big an account as this is, it's maybe 400 different items, and this is at the granular item level that ultimately we're classifying, and so it's, it's not so bad. Mm. Okay, thanks. Um, and then um, we have a question about um, who is considered a Kentucky farm in that KPI. So in addition to being uh, based in Kentucky, are you thinking about size or ownership or sales and also growing practices when you're considering who goes into that metric? We are not in the business of saying who is and is not a real farmer. As the land grant institution, we are here for all farmers. Um, and yeah, that's not a judgment call we make. So if they are a farm enterprise based here in the state, that counts. And so we are not basing on production methods. That would be a different sort of metric, right? If we want to track what sort of production methods we're tracking, we would then have to create a metric for what sort of production methods are being utilized. So we don't do that. Um, what was the other part of that question? Um, growing practices. Yeah. So no, if they're here, they're here, which raises some interesting questions around contract production. So you'll notice if you look at our dining report that a lot of chicken is coming from Pilgrim's Pride, which is a major integrator and a contract producer. So as the land grant, we can't tell those farmers they're not farmers. And that is, I think, an important conversation to have as a food system community, as a, you know, people interested in developing robust, resilient, fair, transparent food systems. Um, yeah, I think that's a valid and important question and one we should address. Oh, did uh, I do that? I don't know. Is this something you'd like to share with us? <laughs> that's one of my backup slides. So if you're wondering, this was in case someone asked how we do a two-part classification on items. So, you know, a case of tomatoes from a Kentucky farm, that's majority farm impact, um, Kentucky business impact. We have things like mixed impact value-added products. So broccoli soup. Uh, we have a local, oh. yeah, there's a ghost in the machine. Um, we have a broccoli soup that's made by a Kentucky-based co-packer um, for our account, but we don't have enough broccoli to supply it all year. So this is some farm impact because when we have local broccoli, we know it's there. We're talking with the manufacturer that's coming from a Kentucky-owned business. So we, we get a little bit granular in this way. We're looking at the business and the farm impact, and we can sort the data based on that. Hmm. Okay, and then I think last question that we have time for, um, have you been able to see or are you tracking an increase in um, local production or land use due to the reliable demand of UK dining? And if so, how are you sharing that information? We are not. That is a great question. We know about the producers we work with, that they have added employees or expanded production um, especially for that salad bar program. Um, so we know that we haven't shared in particular, partially because we're really in the first full year of that initiative, but on a broader level, we haven't. And I'd be open and welcome to any suggestions on how to do that in a meaningful way. Hmm. Okay, great.
Um, unless there are any other questions that anyone wants to drop into the um, question box, I want to thank you all for joining this webinar in the National Farm to Institution Metrics Collaborator Collaborative Webinar Series. Uh, as Jeff mentioned earlier, the collaborative is made up of leading farm to institution organizations from across the country who come together to share best practices for measuring the impact of the institutional market across the supply chain. You can read more about the collaborative and access a sample of resources um, from collaborative members by following this link on the screen and if you have any questions about the collaborative you can email uh, me at hannah farm to institution.org and i'm sure lillian is also open to answering questions um, about this webinar um, or the we have um, one of her resources up on the collaborative page as well our may webinar will feature jeff o'hara from the usda agricultural marketing service who will provide a snapshot of how data collection around local food has advanced in recent years at the national level he's going to dive into the recently released census of agriculture and share a little bit about how the results are improving our understanding of local food markets within the past five years um, o'hara will also identify some of the trends in local food market activity that are not currently being captured by existing federal government statistics um, and we'll be sharing the exact date it'll be in late may and the link to registration um, when we follow up with you all um, after this webinar so thank you again for joining um, and we hope to see you on the next webinar